Hello everyone, this is Frank DeFreitas and welcome to Holotalk, the Internet's laser and holography talk show, enjoyed in over 42 countries throughout the world. And now, here's this week's show. Hi Mark, it's Frank DeFreitas. Hey Frank, how are you? Doing pretty good. Good to finally talk to you. It's great to talk to you. I've been reading uh, all the Holotalks, or listening to the Holotalks for, uh, gosh, since you started. With with your 27 years that you've been, been involved with this, even if we were to condense each year down to a minute, we're still looking at a half hour. So. Ha, 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 that's funny. To go back 27 years, I mean, people that are listening to this show, number one, a lot of them weren't even born yet. Okay. And, and number two, you're going back to a time when you just didn't go out and purchase a laser and go in your basement and do holograms because it was such an expensive purchase. I mean, it was a thing of almost science fiction 27 years ago on the street at least, not to us, but on the street. What got you started in this? Well, I guess I saw my first hologram when I was 12 years old at an art festival down here, and they were from the Smithsonian. They were transmission types, so they were all played back by laser. My dad took me to this show, and the thing that totally knocked my socks off, I was a photographer at the time, and uh, was the fact that there was a, a picture of a book with a magnifying glass, and you could actually move around and see the magnifying glass lens, the mm -hmm. words in the book. That didn't make any sense to me as a photographer, and mm -hmm. kind of stashed in the back of my mind. And then fast forward about four or five years, I read an article in the New York Times written by a lady named Peggy Sealfon, a photography writer, about the New York School of Holography opening, and I just decided, well, you know, damn the torpedoes, I need to go and find out what that's all about. Yeah. And so I got on a plane and went up there and uh, and studied and uh, just got bitten by the bug. Was that, that one of those first exhibits that was in New York at the time? Well, the very, very first exhibit was before the museum, per se, yeah. it was around, and it was over at uh, I uh, uh, International Center for Photography. Yeah. But uh, it wasn't so much an exhibit, but they were teaching down in the basement where later Dan and Sam so famously taught. Uh, 13th Street, New York School of Holography. It was Posey Jackson and Jody Burns and, yeah. uh, were running it, and uh, although they weren't my instructors or anything. So I came back and I told my mom, you know, I was going to buy a laser, and, and she had, you know, visions of Dr. No and, you know, James Bond and all that, and thought I was going to burn a hole through the house. Now this is the early 70s, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so uh, got a laser, built a little laser lab, started re- uh, redoing all the experiments that I'd read people had done that I just couldn't believe the results of. So that was a lot of fun. Then about <clears throat> six months later, I went back to New York with the stuff. This is before the museum opened. And I showed some of the stuff to, to Posey, and you know she kind of <clears throat> flipped out in a positive way and sent Jody off to find me some giant Agfa plates. To me, they were giant. They were 11 by 14-inch plates. Yeah. They said, do this this size. We want to show this at the opening of the Museum of Holography. And I was mm. like, Oh my God! You know, I've never seen a plate so big in my life. I've been working with eight by tens and four by fives. Yeah. And uh, one piece in particular that they liked, although we ended up showing three at the museum's opening, and, and I helped around there, sweep the floors, bolt a you know sign on the wall, and you know tweak lasers and secure lasers, scurry scurry around Edmund Scientific across the across the river and trying to find the bits and parts we could cobble together what we needed to 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 show off the big transmission types that were on loan to the museum, which were, oh, were just a joy. I mean, the big uh, portrait of Gabor, everyone's seen, the oh, whole yeah, portrait, yeah. and you know, some of the classic Fritz Goro stuff, and some of the early McDonnell Douglas stuff, you know, these yeah. meter, some odd size transmission types, which at the time seemed, you know, gargantuan. So we set those up to play back by laser along with all the rest of the stuff at the museum. And it was a very heady time because, uh, uh, well, for gosh sakes, for me, it was like home because out here on the peninsula, there was nobody doing this between here and New York. And uh, so it was like home to me, the fact that a place actually gave me and the work and the medium enough respect to uh, to establish a, a, you know, a museum. I was just really touched by the whole thing, and it was, it was very, uh, it was wonderful. Did you have a piece in that inaugural uh, tour? I think it was called Through the Looking Glass or something when the museum first opened. Yeah, well, the first opening show down there uh, uh, at the museum, there were three. One was Curved Space Time. Uh, one was Holo Dolly, uh, a holographic yeah. uh, uh, portrait of Salvador Dolly that's frozen inside this multifaceted crystal. And the third one was something called uh, uh, Geometric Optical Graphic Design is Observed Through Crystal Bobble Floating in Foreground. And basically, it was a hologram where this giant multifaceted bobble did float about a foot in front of the plate, 
and you could walk up to it and uh, and put your eye up to it and see this geometric design behind it being lensed like hundreds of times through the bottle. So mm -hmm. its lensing function was was captured. I believe it. In that first show, we did a lot of uh, placing of uh, little stickers on the ground, uh, where uh, sort of like you know those games where they show you how to tango or whatever, okay. and where where to put your feet or whatever. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it was kind of instructions on how to yeah. look at the hologram because people weren't unfamiliar with how to address the space. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're so used to we've bro grown up you know with this whole Lascaux Gutenberg tradition of everything is either on the cave wall or in the book or on the TV screen. Everything is flat. And so uh, you have to kind of relearn how to look at the universe as a multidimensional entity that, that it was in the first place when you were born. You know? Well, you, you know, from my observations being out uh, at exhibits, I think we could still use those footprints on the floors now. Oh, yeah. No, no, oh, yeah. especially with projected images. Oh, yeah. You know, projected images are, are a, a situation where you don't know what to expect if you're not, you know, savvy. Yeah, that was an early show. It, it actually, uh, when I went on the road, it stopped in Philadelphia at the Walnut Street Theater trying to think of the year. It was probably mid-70s or so, because I remember uh, I went down. I had a car that had one of the windows was broken out, and I had plastic on the window, and there was no heat in the car, so we were wrapped in blankets as we waited in the parking lot. <laughs> we don't know from that down here in Miami, by the way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you'd know it today up here. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So you do a lot of other things. Now, I'm going to have a link to your website. Oh, that's sweet. You know, along with the uh, the show as well. So when people come to listen to the show, and in fact, if you're listening to the show now, there's no reason to sit there and just stare at the computer. You know, real player will play in the background. So if you go back on the Holotalk page and click on the Diamond Images link, you'll be able to go right to the website while you listen to it as well, you know, providing you can do two things at once, which most of you, I assume, can. Um, to move on, you've always been in Florida, I guess, then, right? Well, based here, yeah, I've yeah. worked in different places, but I, I'm based here in Miami, and I'm kind of a, a tropic, subtropical kind of guy, and don't really want to shovel snow. Yeah, they, they, visitors definitely have to go onto your experience page, as far as you, where you list all the things that you've done. I mean, you've been a photographer for Rolling Stone magazine back in the days. I imagine it was the newspaper back then, because I remember getting yeah, it down it in the village. Yeah, it was the newspaper format, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I've done photojournalism in, in many years, yeah. That was uh, kind of grew up telling stories with pictures, you know, using two-dimensional images. But when I bumped into holography, it opened up a whole other uh, realm, as you can imagine. Yeah. Well, this, this is the real deal with you. I mean, a lot of the people that uh, listen to the show are, are amateurs and hobbyists, you know. And Oh, I, I can mean, address I, amateurs and hobbyists. Oh, sure, I'm, absolutely. But you I'll, I'll, really I can have... tell them the one most inspiring thing that I've discovered. Great, go ahead. <laughs> It doesn't make any difference whether you're 15 years old, 8 years old, or 55, or 80 years old. The next Dr. Dennis Gabor, the next discovery of significant import, perhaps a window into yet another dimension, will come from someone, regardless of their age, who's mm -hmm. paying very close attention. Yeah, absolutely. And what that's the interesting thing uh, throughout the history of science and the whole so-called serendipitous discoveries and and that sort of thing. Somebody was paying real close attention, and uh, uh, that's one very interesting factor, that you don't need to have all the degrees, and you don't need to necessarily be doing this 10 years or 20 years. You mm -hmm. might be doing it you As know, a 10 science days or 10 project. months and stumble upon something, if you're paying close attention to realize what it is you've stumbled upon. Yeah, yeah. And with some of the new light sources, I wouldn't be surprised if we see something come down the pike quickly that... Uh, takes the place of the laser period. I mean, I know we've moved into the laser diodes, but when you start to look at some of the LEDs and things of that nature, I wouldn't be surprised if they start to get down to where they have such oh, a... Oh, uh, I'm totally fascinated. I've been kind of predicting that for about 10 years, ever since I had a student who worked for the Electronics Division of uh, uh, Hewlett Packard out in Palo Alto come in one day when I was teaching on San Jose, and he, and, he, and he handed me a handful of diodes that were at the time in the red range, and they were very narrow band with maybe about 10 nanometer wide... And he was telling me that, you know, the blues were coming and the or yellows were coming, and this was like 12 years ago. And at that point, I realized that perhaps it would be a resurgence in transmission types based on the fact that the light sources were going to cost a dollar versus, yes. you know, $500 or $1,000. And I think that's something that hasn't really been properly exploited yet. But now that you guys are promoting things like shoebox holography and the diode stuff, I have a feeling that, uh, that that's going to be an obvious benefit of, of, uh, of cheap uh, coherent or at least monochromatic sources is 
is the resurgence of the transmission type. Yeah, I love transmission holograms. Me too. Me I too. love crispy, transmission easy. holograms. Yeah. I've been illuminating a 30 by 40 centimeter laser transmission hologram down here now with a, uh, a red LED that I got from Walmart that costs like $1.99. Very so, interesting. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's bright. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. What, what what projects are you working on now? I know if they when when people go to your website, they'll be able to see some of the ones that you've uh, worked on. And the dizzy piece, I have the dizzy piece. Uh, you know, uh, down here working, there's always uh, Coltrane, uh, uh, Parker, Monk, and Davis on. You know, so I have That's holograms. Have, no, no oh. music. Oh, music, the jazz, I, yeah. yeah. So going back to see, yeah, uh, I want to see that John Coltrane. Yeah. Uh, going back to the Dizzy hologram, how did you get involved with that? Well, um, Dizzy, uh, in terms of the creation of the hologram and everything, um, yeah. originally um, I, I went to see him and I uh, perform here, and I had seen him a couple times. I never really talked to him, and uh, I've been doing a series of holograms ever since like the mid late seventies uh, of folks that I really admired, and he was one of them, and and uh, actually really changed a lot in terms of music and, and awareness of the, certainly the Afro um, realm of, yeah. uh, of Afro African rhythms and stuff integrated into into some of the so-called modern music. And anyway, I, I really admired him. I went and it turns out he was a shutterbug. Uh, he was really into photography, and, and I showed him some holograms and. And I asked him uh, if uh, he would sit for me, and he said, sure, why not? And as it turned out, um, he was going to California the next day, and I was going to California the next day, too, because I was working on a hologram that we, we mounted aboard a, a private jet, mm -hmm. interior of a private jet. And, and so I was going out there to work on the model for that, and, and he was going out there, so we decided to do it out there. And um, uh, uh, that was the genesis of it, basically. I asked him. If he would sit for me, and he said, "Yeah, let's do it." Yeah. So you you do that from start to finish, then at those pieces, right? Well, I I. What do you mean? I mean, I, I, well, I mastered the it at a facility in Van Nuys. At the yeah, the, the the film capture uh, again. And oh, the, sure. Yeah. Sure, but for instance, the output of it was done. Uh, I filmed it with Greg Newswanger and okay. Van Nuys uh, back in. Uh, Gosh, I don't remember the year really, but uh, we were in a facility that they had. I think at the time they called it. Um, I want to say ADD, but I know that that's something that they that, that, that's, that's something else these days. Uh, yeah. It was called Advanced Dimensional Displays, I believe, okay. and it was the company that Craig and uh, Chris Outwater had had uh, basically spawned after they unplugged from Disney. Um, that beautiful facility that they put together for for them, and uh, so it's very interesting how sort of sideways uh, Disney kind of spawned the creation of the of the system that that that. You know, was making those giant holograms out there. Now, of course, John Perry's the master. You know, uh, yeah. uh, I think uh, hands down, as far as I'm concerned. How, what's the square footage of your lab, uh, your facility? Uh, right now, yeah. I, I actually work independently of running my own lab. Oh, okay. I had put a facility together uh, a few years ago. The last one I put together was like three labs. Uh, mm. It was huge, and it was 10,000 square feet, and. Uh, and we unplug that lab, and now uh, without the overhead of all that stuff, I can work independently uh, with much greater fluidity. I found that over the years, people who had labs specifically set up to do one particular thing um, had a tendency to, well, only do that thing. And honestly, with there's so many different types of holograms that uh, any given project may re require a specific type of hologram, mm -hmm. and uh, it's very hard to maintain a facility that does all of them well. Yeah. So now I have incredible uh, uh, um, autonomy in terms of, of, of specifying uh, what is required for the project. And like I did a project a year ago with this, uh, I guess it's world's first smelling hologram, uh, which I shot out with Yves Gentet out in uh, in Bordeaux. And he, of course, is the fellow who's been lauded as creating one of the best uh, full color emulsions. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that, that works seen. beautiful. And uh, but uh, by circumstance that was appropriate for this particular project, the smelling hologram, he happened to have a pulse laser uh, uh, ruby there as well as this other rig for creating the full color stuff. So they both work very well because I needed to uh, together because I needed to freeze 
these uh, candies and space for this project. Down oh, the Red Hots. And while I had tried all cool kinds piece. of other ways that's, of doing it, that's a great um, piece. Uh, the best thing to do is just to fly the candy in space, grab it with the pulse ruby laser, and then transfer that master to a white light viewable reflection type. That was ultimately, in the end, the best way to do it. And so now I can specify where to go for and just basically shepherd the project uh, in, in a facility that doesn't belong to me. You know, it's not that I won't build another lab. It's just that for the moment um, I find phenomenal autonomy and, and much lowered overhead on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, let, let me just remind the listeners that these holograms that we're currently talking about, both the Dizzy and, and the Red Hot, are uh, both available on your website for sale. Uh, go over there, check them out, and uh, I'm not quite sure. I don't. I didn't see a price on the Red Hots, but I know it's a, a limited edition of seven or something, right? Right. Yeah, but the uh, Dizzy's an open, an open edition. No, no, no. No. It was. Oh, you mean the giant one? The no, the uh, embossed. Oh, the little one. one. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. much open. Absolutely, yeah. and those are I think twenty bucks or like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, piece of history. If you sell a bunch of those, that's nice, huh? Yeah, it's a piece of history. It's fun. Uh, you know, I always expected uh, uh, a time would come when when we have this sort of democratization of the art form in the sense that you know why does someone have to spend a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand dollars for a, a, a really nice piece of art uh, in this medium? It's for twenty bucks, bam, you're in. Yeah. And, uh, I think that's the way it should be. Honestly, I think all the best holograms in the world need to be remastered for, uh, in a version that can be purchased for 20 bucks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you go into some holography shops and you'll see a 4 by 5 piece of film in there for like 50 bucks, And right. someone will buy one, right. but you'll never get them back to buy a second one. Right. Or, or that magic number that you see always on TV, 1995. Yeah, 1995, yeah. That hologram, God bless you for that hologram you did of the uh, Gloria. Uh, I'd have to have a fan on me and go outside and get some fresh air shooting that. Yeah, she, she's a popping thing. Man. Yeah, and the uh, stereoscopic view uh, on your web page is cool, too. Cause oh, I, it's funny how we struggle to try to convey <coughs> these things in 3D, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what other projects do you have coming up? Well, I've got you know a whole uh, set of them in various states of... Uh, of development uh, since 1990, I've been filming uh, Native Americans. I've got over I think 40, 45 of them in the can of holographic portraits, and full regalia with face paint and the whole nine yards. And uh, somehow I inspired uh, uh, Sharon McCormick to shoot one, which is cool. Mm-hmm. I think she's done a few since then, but um, okay, yeah, yeah. I that's mean. always nice to see when you can inspire people to you know to do something. And uh, even if it's what you do, it's you know if maybe they'll do it better. You know, you never know. Mm-hmm. But uh, but it, that's it's, it's a cool thing. And uh, so those are those are shot. Um, um, I started putting together the elements for a documentary, and uh, that's why I threw up those so-called Holaroids. So if anybody wants to see the old geezers of holography when they were younger, uh, they can go to my website and look at that slideshow. You know what I'm talking about, Frank? Uh, yes. Did you see that? Yeah. Yes. No, I did not click on that, to tell you the truth. I'm oh, sitting here yeah. thinking that's one of the first places I'm going to go as soon as I hang this phone up. Yeah, so-called Holaroids. Yeah. I used to shoot Polaroid photographs. Uh, I was kind of known as the, the documaniac for a while and uh, because I used to shoot video and stills and all kinds of stereograms of holograms. I've got a whole you know, collection of this stuff, which I really would like to put together as a uh, as a little DVD or some kind of presentation where people can... can delve into it as deep as they want. would make a nice CD-ROM. There's a number of CD-ROM projects out there right now for historical holography. I know Georges is doing one in Canada, if he's yeah. not done already. And uh, I've heard of that. And uh, uh, I know that there was some documentary shot on the West Coast. I think Albert Zutis had done some, yeah, which I yeah. haven't gotten to screen yet myself, but I'm, I'm anxious to one day. And, you have uh, a couple of video clips on the website of, you know, from that, from one of the past shows I excellent. did. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I have a lot of this, uh, you know, sort of rare footage in people's laboratories and uh, some of the Lake Forest stuff and um, things that, uh, places that don't exist anymore. And some wow. cases, sadly, people who don't exist anymore. And, um, uh, and so it's going to be very interesting to call this into um, a story that is, uh, it's documentary, but somehow um, entertaining as well, you know. You'll find that when you look through that collection of Polaroids, uh, everyone seems to be smiling a lot. Hmm. I mean, everybody's just so darn happy. And, yeah. Um, uh, so uh, uh, what I'm hoping to capture in this video is, you know, what was it that that made them all so darn happy at the yeah. time? You know. 
Were you happy at the time when you were taking the pictures? Oh yeah. Maybe just rubbed off on them. <laughs> <That'd be laughs> no, there was there was a certain spirit which uh, I don't know if it's been dampened, uh, well certainly in some of the individuals involved, but hopefully not in the uh, youngsters. Yeah. But uh, 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 there's a certain spirit of discovery and uh, of the unknown, uh, exploring the unknown that 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 is just man makes you want to you know wake up in the morning or in the night and jump in a lab and and see, you know, what will come forth. And, yeah. uh, and this is a